Okay, cool. All okay. right. Well, I'm here with uh, Dushan Bogdanovich, who is a guitarist, composer, improviser. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he is you know, the definitive guitarist composer of our generation. So uh, welcome to the podcast, wow. Dushan. It's great to have you. I'm really excited to talk to you. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. You know, I don't know if these compliments are, you know, a bit too much, but that's okay. I have to start with something. You know. So so modest. Okay. Well, um, our uh, our mutual friend, Michael Kadurka, uh, you know, set this interview up to some extent. And uh, the way that I usually start these interviews is by asking about uh, how coffee fits into somebody's life, just as a sort of icebreaker. And um, sure, I, sure. I think he told me that you have a particular sort of a high potency jet fuel that you like. Huh? Uh, in terms of coffee, uh, uh, how does coffee? In terms fit of in coffees, mm -hmm. well, it's just kind of a re <laughs> it's regular espresso, really. It's a okay. regular espresso. It's it's nothing kind of like uh, special, you know. It's it's just espresso. I mean, I don't really drink any coffee. I just drink espresso, you know, okay. which is already like a jet fuel, like you're saying, you know. Right. Uh, okay. So do you do you prepare it at home, or uh, do you have like a an espresso machine? Yeah, just have an espresso machine. Okay. Yep. Um, is there? Do you sort of like darker roasts, lighter roasts? Uh, I'm I'm curious to hear as much detail sure, as you. Sure, sure, sure. Why not? Music is secondary. Not? Might as well. No, no, <laughs> might as well. Might as well. Um, well, um, you know, it's usually I just I just um, actually I have a pop and then I use a filter. Okay. So it's it's kind of. I mean, I've used espresso machines before, but now these days I've been using this filter. So I put some coffee and then I just make it in two rounds, you know. So first I, I just put a little bit of coffee, then I wait maybe a minute or two, and then I do the second one. And then I just add some, uh, you know, some cream, hopefully, uh, you know, like a real, real cream. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. Well, and um, that's that's about it. It's nothing like exclusive or uh, extraordinary. <laughs> I think that when Mike told me about this, it was uh, in the context of like him studying with you, getting lessons, and like uh, I guess like just you know sort of the intense focus of uh, you know your espresso that it offered him. In the... I see. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, you know, maybe I was functioning more more on espresso when I was living in San Francisco. Mm. <laughs> Gotcha. He is, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more easy going, you know, it's Switzerland, you know, so I don't, I don't, I don't speed up as much as I used to. Gotcha. <laughs> um, what's, what's the coffee scene like in uh, Switzerland and Geneva? What, what's the coffee like? Is there any sort of like a coffee culture there that is interesting? Well, just, uh, you know, it's just Europe, you know, I mean, I mean, everybody drinks coffee in Europe, you know, there's just a lot of cafes everywhere. So, you know, you just go to a cafe and, and you know, hopefully you avoid Starbucks if you can. You know. mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of really good coffees around. Cool. So nothing special. You just, you know, you just go to a coffee shop, you, you drink whatever you want, you know, yeah. you just have a... Small cappuccino, medium cappuccino. It is nothing like extraordinary, you know. It's just, mm -hmm. um, you know. I guess just coming from San Francisco, like San Francisco has such a, you know, a, a sort of thing going on with coffee, and like it's like I feel like very elevated, and uh, I don't know. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't have to keep on talking about coffee. Um, so uh, uh, that's okay with the coffee. There's not not so much to say, really. Okay. Well. Um, I heard in a recent interview that you did, um, I think the one with uh, Volterra, uh, the festival, and you mentioned that you were retiring. And um, I'm curious what that what that means for you. Does that just mean retiring from the conservatory, um, or uh, what does retirement mean for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, it it just means I'm drinking less coffee. That's what it means. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I did retire. I retired last year. Okay. You know, and it's not, yeah, it's not necessarily because I wanted to, just in Switzerland, you have to retire when you're 65. And so last year I had my birthday, you know, I was 65 and so I just retired, you know, but actually it wasn't necessarily something, something that I wanted, you know, it was just, it's just the system, you know, if I was in the United States, I could probably, uh, you know, I could work until they find me dead. <laughs> so it's probably like, like a little bit of a different mentality. So. 
Of course, it doesn't mean really very much to me. I mean, it, it just means that I'm not part of this institution and I don't have regular teaching schedules, but that's really all it means. Okay. Um, I still have students sometimes, you know, I work with, sometimes on Zoom. I actually have a tremendous amount of time to compose now. So, so this is really great. I mean, awesome. you know. it's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's, it's, it's very exciting to have like all this time, you know, that I can dedicate. And, you know, so, you know, teaching and uh, teaching in an institution like this, you know, it, it entails a lot of stuff. I mean, you have to prepare uh, concerts for students. You do a lot for students, really. I mean, it's kind of you, you're kind of like a substitute parent, you know, to some extent. You sort of kind of really, uh, you know, I'm just always doing the best I can for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so there's some amount of administration, administrative things to do. And I mean, you know, I'm not an administrator. So, right. you know, that was my favorite thing to do. But you do it anyway, you mm -hmm. know. One thing that I'm seriously missing, though, is, is that I've started this program, a program for, for composer performers or performer composers. And I, I built this program like... It started about six years ago, and it took me a really long time because this is Europe, and in Europe, everything is a lot slower. Mm -hmm. And in Switzerland, it's even slower in the, than in Europe in general. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it took me a long time to build this, and it's a, it, it's a master's program. And I had some uh, really some, some very good students, some excellent, excellent students, some people... Uh, for example, there's this Iranian uh, guitarist, composer, Golfam Khayyam, you probably haven't heard of her, but anyway, she did like really well and, and, and got uh, like a contract with ECM Records. So I was very happy for her, you nice. know, that, wow. that was very, yeah, it was cool. You know, we had Manfred Eicher, you know, the, the director of ECM Records, he came over and sort of gave the intro, et cetera. So, so it's been really like a, like a really nice program and everything. And now, you know, it just died. Hmm. I mean, it just, well, maybe it didn't die. Maybe it needs to resuscitate. Maybe they need somebody else to, to kind of wake up again, you know. So the program but, will um, essentially be gone without you or? Well, I mean, you know, I certainly hope not. I mean, you know, I didn't build it just for myself, you know, hmm. I wanted it to have a continuation and, but from what I see, I mean, nobody's nobody's pulling it, you know, nobody's, uh, you know, you have to have somebody that's willing to really put a lot of energy, a lot of passion, a lot of intensity into it. And I was that person. So, mm -hmm. you know, once I'm gone a bit, um, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, there's lots of other stuff going on. There's a lot of improvisational things that are going on now. So that's good. And there is a world music program now that's in Geneva that, that's really very strong. It's going very strongly. So that's very nice. Wonderful. It's good. Cool. Um, anyway, that's as far as my retirement. <laughs> well, this reminds me of, a, you know, I think back in 2007, um, I auditioned for you and the rest of the staff at uh, the San Francisco Conservatory. And uh, oh. I think that was right when you moved to Geneva, right around then, right? 2007 uh, what year did you say uh 2007 um yeah i i think it, it must have been just around that time mm -hmm. yeah um i recall you i i was studying with a guitarist named uh milo peterson and you made a joke about uh me studying with oscar peterson and uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> okay anyway. i i have to admit that I don't remember that, but uh, I mean, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's easier for me to uh, you know weigh that sure, uh, sure. that memory uh, very highly. Well, um, I see. Okay, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, you've been in San Francisco. You've spent time in Geneva. Um, uh, you're from Serbia, and you've spent time in LA, mm -hmm. as far as I know, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah. I spent uh, like at least ten years in LA. So sure, I, sure. I'm, I'm curious what uh, these sort of different locations that you've been in, um, like these different scenes, uh, what sort of like parts of your playing and composition you might relate to them? Like, is there anything, any sort of aspect mm -hmm. to your playing and composition you would relate to those locations? I think that's a very interesting question. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. nobody asked me this question before. I think it's a very good question. Um, Actually, I, I've never really thought very deeply about this, but now that you mention it, um, I think 
I think that there is really like a lot of, um, there's a certain spirit of a place, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, sure, I was also getting older you know, as time went by. So, so some of my kind of priorities, interests changed too. Mm -hmm. But when I came to Los Angeles, I was just, um, I was pretty much finished with classical music. So I thought, I, I didn't even think I would ever return to classical music. I was just so much more interested in improvising and mm -hmm. playing jazz, world music, experimenting, uh, you know. So actually that's the time when I did a lot of, uh, primarily doing a lot of, uh, you know, like jazz gigs. And uh, I played with some really excellent musicians, Milcho Levyev, you know, a, a great Bulgarian uh, composer, um, jazz improviser, pianist. Then I worked with Charlie Hayden a little bit with the recording and James Newton I worked with who was just, uh, you know, fantastic flutist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he still teaches in uh, perhaps at Cal Arts or in any case, <clears throat> those were the people I worked with. Miroslav uh, Tadic, my friend, uh, guitarist, a great guitarist. So anyway, uh, at that time, I was sort of opening up to all these different influences. And I was trying, I was wiggling sort of my way to find really where do I belong. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't very obvious. It wasn't very obvious mm -hmm. because, you know, I came from the background of being a composer, classical guitarist. I mean, I did all these uh, big classical competitions and won prizes and this and that. And so at that point, um, I was pretty much uh, finished with all that. I mean, I just wasn't actually interested in this anymore. And mm -hmm. so, um, so this was really a kind of like an opening up to, to, to a different spirit. And LA was really the, the, the kind of place that's, that, that's right for that. I mean, so I think that perhaps me combined with Los Angeles, sort of we made this kind of like teamwork of kind of like opening up to different influences, to different sources, different uh, ways of, of being creative and doing things. And then uh, of course, I mean, I knew, uh, you know, the guys from USC very well. Mm -hmm. I still remember I did, um, this is now like um, prehistory, you know, it's like a Mesozoic or something. And I remember when I came to LA and I, and I did some uh, master classes uh, for uh, guitar and there was like Bill Kanengeiser and Scott Tennant and you know, mm -hmm. the guys from the LA Guitar Club. Anyway, I remember I did master classes on um, just improvising classical music. Mm -hmm. That was kind of like a bizarre thing to do, you know, and I mean, I was always doing that kind of stuff. So I remember I played some uh, preludes like on Bach, on uh, like a Baroque style, and then I did some Renaissance and played a prelude to a prelude of uh, Villa Lobos and things like that. Um, so anyway, that was kind of like, um, that was an interesting time and kind of experimenting a little bit with that too. It's sort of combining the classical forms, classical idioms, uh, with contemporary music and with jazz improvisation. Um, what else can I say? Um, yeah, that was that was LA. It was you know I, I I was I lived actually a long time in Santa Monica. I was very happy to live in Santa Monica. I lived by the beach, nice. and um, I was always I mean my my Kudirka, you know talking of the coffee and. I always used to hang out there by the beach. You know, there was like this, uh, I don't know, what was it called? Cafe Casino. I don't okay. know if it still exists, Cafe Casino. Anyway, I used to tell my students, I would say, meet me at my office. That was my <laughs> office. <laughs> it was Cafe Casino, which was there on the beach. You know? Interesting. I'm going to have to so, look into it and see if it's still around. Yeah, I don't know if it's still around. It was a very nice place. It was just a very relaxing place. And um yeah, so it's really kind of just brings all these fun memories and uh, lots of, you know, just traveling, starting to do festivals and this and that. And uh, so anyway, about that time, I started to go a bit back also into classical music. I, I, I kind of figured out that that was still a very strong orientation for me. It was a very strong source. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then I joined uh, this uh, trio, the guitar trio, the Fire Trio. Oh, yeah. And 
yeah so that was that was really nice mm -hmm. and 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 we had these these sort of like very eclectic sort of gigs you know where we would play uh classical music and then we would also do uh you know like uh, jazz standards and then i would write some originals and this uh you know colleague and friend of mine kenton Yangstrom, who was in the group uh he was doing a lot of jazz standards so so you know charlie parker and and, and all kinds of things mm -hmm. So it was pretty adventurous, actually, at that time. You know, that was in the 80s. That was in the 80s. So like, uh, I don't know, 80, towards the end of 80s, maybe 86, 7, et cetera. Anyway, that, that was a pretty important part of my life at that time. And uh, so I got back into classical music by doing this. I did also some other stuff. I, I worked with um, Elaine Comparone a really great harpsichord is from mm -hmm. New York. And uh, we recorded uh, we recorded all the trio sonatas by Bach, six trio sonatas by Bach. Then we recorded all the inventions in two voices, three voices. So we did like two records. Is that, and, uh, Bach, uh, that was, with, that... Bach with Pluck? Is that what it is? Yes, it is. It is. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't <laughs> my idea. Bach with pluck. I know, I know. It's just kind of <laughs> cheesy. It's very cheesy. But anyway, you know, I, I, you know, I felt a bit embarrassed. But what can you do? You know, mm -hmm. you just have a company, and they just uh, they try to do, do do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, it was it was very nice. We did some some very nice concerts together and stuff, and uh, did some festivals. So uh, that way, I kind of got a bit back into classical music. Mm -hmm. and uh, became more friends uh, with, with uh, guitarists at USC. Um, you know, like Jim Smith was really a great mm -hmm. friend of mine and Bill Cunningheiser, of course. And then um, I didn't know so much the, the, the people in the jazz department, um, but, um, you know, more and more classical department. And, and, the, you know, like and the composition, Brian too. Brian Head, I was just going to say, mm -hmm. yes, Brian Head. Brian Head, who really stayed like a great friend of mine, and, mm -hmm. and uh, man, yeah, Brian is just, uh, he's just uh, mm -hmm. really a great musician, and, and fantastic composer, and great guitarist. I, I just have the highest respect for him. You know? I had the pleasure of uh, studying with him briefly when I was at USC, um, and yeah. he was sort of helping me straddle the lines between, huh. you know, the improvisation and like, just having technique because you know I, i'm much more of an ah. electric jazz player with a uh, no real true classical technique uh okay i just do whatever i can okay uh, uh -huh. but proceed <laughs> <laughs> okay okay yeah he actually came over uh was this last year it was last year i i was part of organizing an, an improvisational festival it was just a just called the Im improvisational festival. It didn't have any other kind of. But anyway, that was great. That festival last year in uh, February, just before this uh, COVID business started, the virus. You know, it was mm -hmm. just before that, so we just caught it in time. And I invited Brian to come over, so he came over, gave a lecture on his music, and and it was very, very, very nice to have him here again. And actually, it was a very exciting festival. It was very interesting. Also invited um, Bruce Arnold. Oh yeah, yeah. Is that New mean York? anything? Yeah, Bruce Arnold from New York. And <laughs> as a matter of fact, a few more years uh, ago, like in 2016 or 17, I did another festival. Those are like two festivals I did in my life. You know, I've never done any organizing festivals. So the first one was called the multiple modernities for composers and performers. Okay. It's kind of like, it had to be something complicated, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> multiple modernities is just like, a, it's a theory. It's a theory in sociology, okay. or kind of like a cultural theory, in the sense that there is not only one uh, kind of Western modernity, which we call modernity, but it actually mm -hmm. includes various uh, different sources, different centers. So. There might be a different kind of modernity in in Asia, say in Africa, etc. And so, so that was one of one of the sort of the essential ideas there. And also, uh, it was like super eclectic. It's like I don't think it could get much more eclectic than mm -hmm. what what we did there, you know. So we had some of the people from the I don't know if, if Aga Khan Foundation. Does that mean anything? 
Uh, I don't think so. No. Aga Khan Foundation. No. <laughs> okay. It's this this great foundation uh, that works primarily in the Middle East and also in in China and along the 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 the, 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 the Silk, Silk Road. And so um, so we had some really great musicians there. There was a, a woman. Ever heard of? No. What? She's a woman, by the way, too. <laughs> woman. Her name is Woman. She's, she, I was like, she's I, great, I don't know which uh, woman you're talking about. Uh, I, I, I know. I know. Okay. Well, this woman <laughs> is spelled differently. Okay. Gotcha. Her, her name is W-U-M-A-N. Okay. Uh, I'm unfamiliar. Huh? Woman. Yeah. This is, I know. She's not a very well-known woman. But anyway, she's a, she, she's a fantastic pipa player. She's actually like uh, the Horowitz. She's the Horowitz of the people <laughs> players of the world. Cool. She's, she's, she's great. Yeah, she, she was fantastic. She was just... Uh... So we had some world musicians like that. There was uh, this uh, Syrian, um, Basil Rajub, uh, this great player, you know, sax player. And then, uh, then I, I brought again Bruce Arnold. He came over with his band. You know, it was just like fantastic, you know, I mean, the kind of stuff that he's done. Uh, I was primarily really interested in, in his stuff because it's so kind of, um, how shall I say, just so sort of uh, uh, non-existent, you know, hmm. what I mean is he takes like these some, sometimes, I mean, you know, he can, he can do anything really. Right. But he sometimes takes these classical pieces like, uh, say, like Messian or contemporary things like mm -hmm. Webern. And then he sort of deconstructs the system. And then, you know, he just improvises. I mean, they improvise and things. So I have these recordings with Schanberg, you know, improvisations, yeah. Webern canons, uh, you know, things like that, or Messian, the le, le pour la fin du temps, you know, the quartet for the end of the time. Mm -hmm. So they just actually groove on these things, like on the on the quartet for the end of the time. Wow. And it just sounds like nothing you've ever heard, you know? I'd love to hear really. that. Really, so yeah. for example, yeah, I mean, for example, that kind of stuff is just like non-existent. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody do that. So so that was my my main interest was just to kind of like get some really interesting kind of unusual and creative uh, uh so anyway then i did invite my uh, student golf i'm this iranian uh, that i mentioned to you the iranian guitarist composer and she did her concerto for guitar and orchestra and then um uh there was um, uh, a tabla guy that came over and then he do, did also lectures on you know the tabla and, and uh, you know the, the timing and all that and also some um, mixed media things did also some mixed media things so it was just great you know it was it was just great oh you know who else was there i mean i should have thought but i didn't david rosen but david rosen does that mean anything no it oh i I feel like I just need need to have my memory jogged, and uh, then it will suddenly. Okay, play. <laughs> okay, sure, 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 sure. Well, you know, he's been at CalArts. At CalArts, he was actually the. How do you say the? I'm beginning to forget my English. You know, the chief of a department, not a yeah, chief. Like of the, the, the head of the department. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the composition. And, and actually, he, uh, you know, he he worked on on making this a composer performer program, and that was also like my my great interest to kind of like uh, pick his brains, so to say, about the composer performer. Mm -hmm. And he's also he's a, he's absolutely fantastic composer and, and a great pianist. He was a great improviser, and it was just so kind of fantastic to see him there. I mean. He actually uh, had this uh, software program that was translating brain waves oh, wow. into yeah. synthesized sounds. <laughs> Incredible. So that was really kind of very out there, so to say. I mean, it was very interesting. You know, they were like these two students, you know, these victims. They were just sitting on the stage and, you know, he put all these electrodes on their heads. And then there were all these sounds coming, uh, you know, kind of, kind of like a very, very interesting stuff, very exciting stuff. Um, so, yeah, I must remember the name from looking through the the CalArts website, uh, but I, I wasn't familiar with his music. Yeah. Uh, just yeah, yeah. hearing that name. 
Um, well, the, the the most interesting story, the most interesting story was was that he showed us uh, his photos with with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. <laughs> oh, nice, cool. So so that was very funny. I, I mean, I don't know. You're a young guy, maybe you don't remember John Lennon, but you know, <laughs> it, it it was just funny to see that. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, that's for the moment. I'm I'm curious. Uh, this is all happening in Geneva, uh, right? The these festivals are. Can you talk about uh, San Francisco's sort of influence on your playing and career, or like what that phase meant to you of being in uh, the okay. area? Okay. Yes. 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 You're right. You're right. It's kind of interesting to um, uh, actually, in a way, I kind of talked a lot about LA, and then I kind of stopped, you know, talking about San Francisco. So yes, you're right. Well. You know, I didn't have like a steady teaching gig when I was in Los Angeles. Um, I taught just a little bit at USC and um, just, uh, I was actually touring a lot. Mm -hmm. I was touring a lot, and especially with this group, with the Fire Trio. And sometimes we did like really like uh, massive tours, you know, like 50, 60 concerts. And, you know, you could just live almost the whole year of like three months of touring, you mm -hmm. know, so I didn't really have to teach all that much. You know. And then I did a lot of recordings of that um, idea. I did a bunch of recordings, uh, a lot of recordings for uh, for this uh, MA Records. I don't know if you ever heard of this people. MA Records, he was in Japan primarily and then kind of moved to LA. And then at that point, there was a, a job, a teaching job at San Francisco. And so I just, um, I talked to David Tannenbaum, you know, who, mm -hmm. who, who is still the head of the department now. Mm -hmm. Now I remember what he's called. <laughs> anyway, uh, he invited me to come. And, uh, you know, so I came over there to San Francisco. And that was a very different scene. It was a very, uh, it was still kind of a, uh, you know, pretty eclectic, mm -hmm. but I can't say that it was as eclectic as Los Angeles. I thought it was a bit more kind of, I mean, it's a small city, you know, San Francisco compared to LA is, is a lot smaller, but also the spirit uh, was kind of a bit more sort of um, um, more contained, let's say. I was gonna say conservative, not necessarily conservative, but more contained. Mm -hmm. more contained okay maybe it's the climate too i'm not sure what it is you know san francisco is a bit colder la's got a lot of sun all the time um i sometimes have the feeling that the climate means quite a lot actually mm -hmm. so anyway uh what i did in san francisco a lot was uh, i kind of actually tried to install some of these things that i've done uh you know from my trip from europe and then coming to los angeles so for example, I did um, I did improvisation uh, classes, classes in fretboard harmony, uh, kind of like uh, you know lots of things along those lines. And then I also developed this uh, improvising uh, in the Renaissance, in the mm -hmm. Renaissance style. And then eventually I wrote a book about that. I wrote a counterpoint and uh, with improvisation uh, in the Renaissance style. Um, and then also the work that I did, you know, with the harmony, actually, finally, that book is now just came out like last week. <laughs> nice. Um, and that, that sometimes it happens. I, I was looking it's for just, the book, but um, I, I, was, I was sort of wondering where to find it. Uh, it's called Harmony for Classical Guitar, right? Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harmony for Classical. It's kind of specific. It's pretty mm -hmm. specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, to come back to, to San Francisco. So. I did that. I had my classes, uh, worked with some groups. Um, and then I, I did more kind of like theoretical and compositional part, you know. So so that was that was pretty good. I was pretty happy to to do that. So I did, for example, like analysis of guitar literature. Mm. And uh, you know, I would start with uh, I don't know, classical, romantic, and then the the, the next year I would do like contemporary 20th century uh, literature. And so actually a lot of these analysis also remained for this book, for this harmony for classical guitar. Because, you know, I spent like, uh, God, I spent quite a few years there in San mm -hmm. Francisco. You know, I think I was looking through my calendar the other day, I think I spent maybe 17 years. Yeah. It's a lot of time, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of time. 
So, <laughs> and you know, it was a lot of fun. I, I totally enjoyed, I actually very much enjoyed both places. I very much liked LA for different reasons, you know, mm -hmm. because I like really hot climate, you know, so I really like the tropical uh, climate. And also it's kind of more sort of uh, open, eclectic, and you know, I, I wasn't very happy about the traffic. That's like probably uh, the worst parts of LA, I think for me, I just hated driving everywhere, yeah. but you know, <laughs> Yeah, there's always something. So, mm -hmm. but uh, San Francisco though was great. Um, I I was very kind of fleetingly um, in touch with um, uh, the Ali Akbar Khan Institute, which okay. is like somewhere around there, like San Rafael, I think. So I had some connection with Indian musicians too, and I still, you know, maintain my connections with Los Angeles. So I would go to LA fairly fairly often. Um, and then I would travel and, you know, go to Japan and do various kinds of tours and stuff. So, um, yeah, so San Francisco is a beautiful place. It's a great, I mean, also aesthetically, you know, I mean, kind of kind of Europeans tend to always uh, mm -hmm. think of San Francisco as the most European city in the United States. I mean, I don't know. It depends what kind of right. Europe you're thinking of. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Boston also looks like Europe. Maybe more like England. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, I'm curious, uh, with the uh, the polymetric polyrhythmic studies, uh, ah, I feel like that's been described as your theoretical work. Uh, I don't know if you think of it that way, but is that sort of in that San Francisco time frame? Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, sure. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was just something that I was very sort of uh, intrigued. I was very intrigued by that. And mm -hmm. so... To some extent, it came from my involvement with uh, with the Balkan odd meter, mm -hmm. and then sort of figuring out that actually the Balkan odd meter can also be be polyrhythmic or polymetric. Mm -hmm. So I started doing more and more of these kinds of things, you know. So like, uh, you know, like say two times nine, eighteen, and then three times six. So then I would combine with three bars of six, eight, and then two bars of nine, and then sort of combine like different types of, uh, uh, you know, different types of divisions, subdivisions and stuff like that. And then there was this, uh, uh, there was this piece that I wrote for maybe, you know, Michael Newman, Newman Altman duo in New York. Maybe. It's a guitar, classical oh, no, no, guitar, no. but that's okay. You know, it's okay. I mean, you, you can't do everything. Anyway. They they commissioned me at some point, and I wrote this piece uh, for two guitars and string quartet. So there, I just really kind of went berserk with all these uh, polyrhythms and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I wrote actually a book. It was kind of like a test textbook about uh, uh, polyrhythmic exercises, and that was really um, I don't know. It was just for myself. You know, in a way to kind of to clear up these these things in my head, you know, because I was using them, and then I thought, well, why don't I make something a bit more systematic? Mm -hmm. You know, so so then I systematized a bit more, and I kind of I like systematizing. I guess it's like something I like to do sometimes. Right. I like making categories, and then sort of analysis is something that I I, I mean I enjoy them doing. Not not always, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that was part of what I did, you know. And then later on, I discovered, like, say, Ligeti's uh, studies for piano, you know, mm -hmm. which are like uh, an incredible feat yes. of precisely all the polyrhythms, etc. But actually, I, I, I didn't know anything about that when I was doing my studies. So I was just surprised later to, to see that. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be maybe also the background in odd meter sort of tends to kind of liberate you from you know just 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 sort of the regular metrics you know right because you already think of meter as something kind of really sort of irregular and flexible and so you you kind of think of it as something that can move around and then also to some extent african music you know which was mm -hmm. very interesting for me uh, always um and actually primarily first first time i heard um uh uh, pygmy music. It was by this uh, Bibayak, Bibayak tribe from uh, Gabon. Mm -hmm. I was just absolutely stunned. You know, I was just blown away by this stuff. You know, it's just um, 
I've heard from another uh, sort of like very rhythmically mm -hmm. focused uh, composer who's uh -huh. much more of like a computer musician, uh, Mark Fell. He's oh. mentioned his influence from uh, Pygmy Music, and I'm curious if you can uh, really? point uh, yeah. any sort of listeners towards anything that's worth checking out. Sure, sure. That, that's very interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. Um, what it is, is, uh, you know, like I mentioned, is the, the Bibayak Pygmies and then the Aka Pygmies. And there are some other, I mean, you know, I'm not like a total expert on this, but, you know, what I was really fascinated was was the vocal polyphony. Mm, okay. Because, you know, there's some music that is, is very kind of like a very discreet little rhythmical, uh, you know, accompaniment. But actually what's the most exciting is that you get like these four or five voices mm. and they're all interlocked. They're like interlocked patterns. And it just, uh, you know, sure, it's very repetitive and stuff, but it's like incredible. I mean, the intricacy of these things is just uh, just magnificent, you know. And they often do yodeling as well. So it okay. also includes the yodel. And uh, now that I mentioned this, I will also mention, uh, I invited this uh, great uh, ethnomusicologist, Sim Haram, who is, uh, I think he's still alive. <clears throat> anyway, he was the director of the French... Uh, uh, ethnomusicological, uh, whatever it is, university or something, organization. Anyway, he spent 20 years with, with uh, uh, pygmies in, in Central Africa, and I invited him to come to Geneva, and so he came over maybe, uh, oh, no, it must be like uh, eight, nine years ago. And he just came over and, and like, talked about it, and, uh, you know, he had all these fantastic examples um, so he came to Geneva and spent a week, you know, he spent the week talk, talking about it. So I was just really thrilled about that. I thought that was fantastic. Then he mentioned also that he influenced, uh, also he influenced Ligeti <clears throat> to, you know, to use, to use this, this, this music in, uh, in his studies. And he even mentioned Steve Reich. He said that also Steve Reich, you know, used some of his material. So I think... You know this this kind of stuff, like the the, the, the polyrhythmic nature of, of African polyphony, is just like a, it's it's like an incredible source of interest. And sure, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, you know Herbie Hancock, that that his uh, headhunters, like the beginning of funk, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. like his his funk. I mean, that was already to some extent influenced by precisely by you know by African tribal music by probably by pygmy music too i'm not completely sure mm -hmm. so anyway um yeah so that's that that was one of very exciting things now this polyrhythmic stuff didn't really come to me as an abstract thing you know it was just uh that i, that I noticed that i was getting more and more involved in this mm -hmm. and so that's why i wrote this book you know finally just to kind of uh just to clear it up and to make it a bit more uh kind of maybe to make it more abstract in a way you know and this is the uh the polymetric book or uh the rhythm book yeah book. is that yeah published or oh yeah a long time ago oh, it's just like from 86 maybe i i think i wrote it 86 uh -huh. um, i guess i always thought that was only the the etudes um i've never seen this <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 no 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 down. well it's actually no no these are actually uh these are series of studies but they're all kind of like categorized you know they're categorized and they have first like simple studies mm -hmm. and then after that come like uh you know these uh more complicated studies gotcha. um apart from that i wrote another uh thing called ex solvo you know mm -hmm. which was kind of like out of an egg so it's kind of the idea was you use a motif and then what can you do with one motif so that's been kind of like my eternal theme so to say is just I had this idea, um, I was thinking um, one day, I thought I was looking at this uh, uh, Hokusai, you know Hokusai, maybe the Japanese? Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, <laughs> anyway. He, I'll know some did, of like, like this. <laughs> well, uh, it's okay, it's okay. There's this beautiful Japanese wood prints, okay. and uh, they're called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And so what, what he, he has these 36 different views of Mount Fuji. And in each one of them, there is Mount Fuji, but completely on some of them, it's just tiny, tiny, you can barely see it. And some of them, 
you're at the at the bottom of the Mount Fuji. So uh, it was kind of like uh, angles and perspectives on the mm. same thing. And so that got me thinking a lot about how can I make some kind of a transformation of the same motif, like having just one subject, mm -hmm. one object, and then through how many different systems you can sort of run this one object. And so that's where I uh, uh, started working on these different kinds of transformations. And so this is, gets kind of technical, so I don't know if I need to get into this, <laughs> but... Well, then, um, I generally like to pride myself on having this podcast not... Uh, not you know simplify anything for the layperson. We can get as technical oh. as you want. It will give me greater joy. <laughs> okay, okay. Why not? Well, then I'll be a little bit technical. Okay. I'm not going to get too technical, but um, so what it is, uh, the idea was this: um, in these different kinds of transformations, I would first distinguish there there is interpretation, there is variation, and then there is transformation. So interpretation is when you interpret the same sort of pattern in different systems. Okay. So what that means is, for example, you have, let's say, just some kind of a pattern, say, pam, pa, pa, pam, pam, or something like that. Now, you can interpret this in various sort of meters. It could be just like a 3, 4. It could be like a, a 3, 16. It could be a... Uh, five, it could be seven, it could be nine. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that was that was one of the ideas was that you have the same uh, skeletons, so to say, mm -hmm. and then you interpret it differently. And the same thing with the melody. This melody could be actually interpreted in various kind of harmonic or, or uh, melodic contexts. So that's been a great interest for me. I find that absolutely fascinating that you can have the same pattern Mm -hmm. the same theme the same melody and you can run it through through like like a huge amount of of different systems of reference mm -hmm. i think that's kind of pretty clear then uh after that you have a uh, technical variation which which uh, sim haram in his his book about the the african polyphony he mentions variation is kind of like an african way of varying motifs so that's also kind of like a transformation of the motif but uh, it's not necessarily systematic. It's kind of like a, you have a certain number of variants and then you just sort of like improvise essentially those variants. Okay. But there is always a certain number of variants. And then some other very interesting things like that, there is this called commutation principle where you have two patterns and then one pattern remains constant and then the other pattern keeps on changing. So I've used that in a lot of my music, actually. So say you just have a pump. Let's say you have pump, pump, pump. So let's say this uh, pump, pump stays the same. We can do pump, pa pa pump, pump, pa 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 pump, 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 pa pa pump, 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 pump. So one pattern stays the same, and then the other is permanently changed. Then you can change both of them. <laughs> So anyway, this was uh, this was kind of like my research into this uh, different types of transformation. Then, then I got more into uh, like research into phasing, okay. which is like essentially you know the kind of uh, the kind of stuff that Steve Wright did, which you know is also extremely interesting. And again, in African music, there is a lot of you know mm -hmm. this moving from the downbeat to the upbeat, so that the same phrase is kind of uh, interpreted differently. Uh, and then, um, then there are various other things like additives, sub subtractive. So where you're kind of taking certain notes from the motif and then you're adding certain notes. And then there are other kinds of um, other sort of uh, transformation. So anyway, the whole text is really about transformation, but how do you transform one motif? And um, in a way that I've stayed with me, you know, all these years, and perhaps, uh, perhaps that's one of the things that where I have, I would say, I have facility in kind of going from one language to another. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I I don't have anything like so kind of fixed or established as my own kind of quote unquote language, mm -hmm. language or 
I don't know, style is too vague, let's say language. Okay. So, yeah, a lot of my things, like maybe 50% is tied to the Balkan music and, you know, to the odd metrics and things. like. But then there's a lot of other stuff which really kind of goes into different areas, also into more abstract areas. And when I was younger, when I was a student, I used to write just eight tonal music. That's all I ever wrote. You know, it was just... I'd like to hear what some, that you know. sound like. Pardon? Yeah, I'd like to hear what some uh, some earlier uh, you know compositions of yours that are in an atonal style would sound like. Uh, it sounds uh, unexpected to me. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, you know, <laughs> I still have certain. I have certain pieces. I have something for piano, six Richard cars for piano, which mm. was, for example, which was premiered uh, relatively recently, maybe five, six years ago. And this is kind of like a somewhere on the edge, you know, it's kind of, sometimes my music sort of like a hints, let's say, hints at tonality or modality. And then sometimes it goes over, sometimes it stays. Um, but anyway, yeah, so my background as a composer was really, uh, you know, kind of an eight on the uh, composer. I used a lot of serial music and that's what I was studying at that time. And also influences of Bartok, Stravinsky and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you said something in a different uh, interview that uh, I thought was interesting, and you know, you mm -hmm. mentioned that like the odd meters of Balkan music aren't really polyrhythms, although people you know like no. think of them as that basically because it's just like oh, uh, difficult rhythmic thing. But um, then you mentioned right. African music, and um, mm -hmm. it seems like African music is a lot more about the the division of time than the multiplication of time. You know, um, like mm -hmm. it's more like okay, more tuplety sort of like uh, divisions of time and i'm curious um if that like mm -hmm. is anything that you think about like sort of like uh i guess like the i don't know like sort of like the overtones of uh tuplets you know or like uh just dividing instead of multiplying rhythms um well i'm not really sure you know it's not a very clear more... question but <laughs> yeah no, no 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 but i understand what you're saying yeah. i understand i think i understand what you mean yeah mm -hmm. Um, you know what, I think like part of what I do, part of what I do is kind of like locked in rhythms. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you're dealing with kind of regular units. With these regular units, so there, there's a various sort of levels of complexity or um, uh, division, subdivision, etc. you know. Mm -hmm. But then I also worked a lot with kind of quasi improvised music, which is more functioning like along lines of six tuplets, quintuplets, etc. So mm -hmm. sometimes I combine the both. So sometimes you have like regular rhythmic divisions, and then at the same time you have these irregular ones. Mm -hmm. um, I just view all of this as a kind of like a real free space. You know, it's kind of like a uh, it's just sort of like open there, and then you just you just go and and you just sort of go along with what's going on and then whatever kind of whatever works really the best i mean you just you just follow that mm -hmm. i was actually um thinking also about a friend of mine jeff holmes who you probably mm. know jeff i'm actually interviewing him in a few days <laughs> oh really mm -hmm. oh yeah. okay okay <laughs> also yeah, set up by jeff michael Kaderka. Yeah, yeah, Jeff is incredible. He's yeah. an incredible composer and, and he's a great guy. And, you know, I mean, I actually used to teach him in San Francisco a long, long time ago. Then he just went elsewhere and did his, his things. But for example, I, I was just thinking of him because some of the stuff that, that I've listened of his music, you know, some of the polyrhythmic sort of complexities, some of the stuff uh, that he's written for piano, like, 17 over 23 you know things mm. like that i mean it's just like it's mind-boggling you know i mean and and i mean i don't know who this pianist is but you know <laughs> he must be some kind of a incredible like a like a you know like a computer expert i mean just amazing so i think that that you know there is this kind of stuff is kind of attractive to some people some people find this kind of very very interesting and then some people don't you know, some people just don't but I wanted to mention Jeff because you know he's done incredible amount of work, I think, precisely on the polyrhythm and uh, you know, on this kind of like the irregular sort of uh, 
uh, irregular rhythmic spaces, if I would call them that. Um, he's much more um, homogeneous, I would mm. say. I think his language, is, is uh, his approach is much more homogeneous. I am not so homogeneous. I mean, maybe just because of my personality, I don't know, or <laughs> just, you know, some people are kind of tend to be more eclectic. Some people are, uh, tend to be more homogeneous in a way. You just kind of find something, and uh, mm -hmm. so anyway, I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Well, um, I want to I want to respect your time because you know it's uh it's evening over there. Um, but I I have a, a couple more questions I want to ask you. Just want to sure, uh, sure. know if I have sure. to blow through them or not. I won't starve. I won't starve yet. Okay. Yeah, wow. it's okay. Um, well, okay. Let's see here. Um. So, you know, you're doing this, uh, you just released this Harmony book, and um, it's kind of funny, I just um, got the Elliot Carter <laughs> Harmony book, and I heard you mention Elliot Carter on the other interview, and um, I was kind of like, I wasn't surprised by it, but I was also kind of not expecting you to mention Elliot Carter, and I'm curious, like, that type of material is so exhaustive in a similar way to, like, your systematic approach. Um, right. What do you think of sort of like that, you know, approach of just here's a huge amount of material that I have to somehow embody. Uh, like, you know, is that something that you think about in your music? Well, <laughs> this is, no, no, these are good questions. Of course, these are good questions. You know what? I actually feel a bit uh, kind of, a bit alienated from this whole kind of avant-garde uh, area, you know, and, and I think from that whole period, I mean, I was very much involved and interested in this. Uh, like I said, I was kind of, uh, you know, following, uh, you know, a lot uh, Ligeti, especially Ligeti. I always liked him. I still like Ligeti a lot, actually. Yeah. I remember I was so amazed listening to his Requiem for the first time and, and the looks at Terna and all these different things. Um, Stockhausen and Boulez, of course, Boulez, because Geneva is like, you know, next to Paris. It's mm -hmm. like that the Paris uh, poor sister or something. Like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I was at some point when I discovered this pygmy music, I was just kind of um, turned off sort of to, to, to the whole avant-garde scene. I just thought it was just uh, far too complicated for humans, mm -hmm. far too abstract, far too intellectual. It didn't pay much attention to just like a, like a physical groove to the emotion right. and all this. And so at that point, this is kind of more like my psychological uh, sort of uh, situation, you know, where, where I just felt that this wasn't something that I was interested in. So now that you mentioned Elliot Carter, you know, mm -hmm. coming back to that, I think I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, who's to say really what is the reality in all this? I mean, anybody can really say from whatever level is there, you know, can say this is simple or this is complex, right. you know, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, in a way, I mean, I have to admit for me, Elliot Carter is very complex. <laughs> I mean, there's no yep. question about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, I listened to, to uh, you know, uh, like his string quartets and I studied to some extent and, you know, and, and also like his guitar pieces. I mean, I worked with some of my students on, on the changes and uh, shards and things mm -hmm. like that. I think, you know, uh, there, there's uh, on, on intellectual level, I think this music is incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me still, I feel that emotionally it kind of leaves me pretty cold. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, you know, that's where I changed after I stopped being a student, you know, when I wasn't studying composition anymore. And um, I felt that I needed some emotional satisfaction really from music. I needed to actually feel specific things you know right. not just feel like energy like oh this is high energy this is low energy you know what i mean now i'm excited because these rhythms are going like a crazy and i just felt like a real necessity you know and that's where i felt that the folk music the world music mm -hmm. was kind of telling us something you know and i felt that these sources that the the, the world music were kind of like a more balanced uh, integration of, uh, what, what could I say, of, of, uh, of, the, of the layers of, of, of human being, mm -hmm. you know, how we are built, what are our intellectual, emotional, physical layers, 
I think that there is an integration. It's more integrated. So if I think of Carter now, I mean, I don't think it's really very integrated kind right. of in that sense. In in the sense like of emotionally, I mean, I can't listen to Carter and then just like, uh, you know, like cry, you know, feel sad <laughs> or feel extremely happy, you know, and say, oh man, I'm just, you know, I just feel so yeah. happy to listen to this Carter for that. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe there are people who can do that, but, you know, so for me, there is a problem with, with, uh, with excessively, I would call it excessively complex music. Okay. Because it's sort of like it detracts to some extent from the emotional quality of the music and what, what the music, uh, what the music brings really mm -hmm. emotionally or physically, like just a groove, you know, you just get the groove, you get to dance. Uh, you don't have to dance necessarily, but you know, you have physical impulse. So in that sense, I, I, my orientation and my interest is to kind of to create integrated, what I would call uh, uh, integrated music that's kind of like presenting, I mean, it sounds kind of stupid, but you know, a balanced human being. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that a lot of other kinds of music, like world music, rock, blues, mm -hmm. um, a lot of other kinds of music actually does bring that, you know. I actually think that there is, you know, there is much more emotional integration. However, you know, some of this music is like intellectually, like really kind of on, on, on a childish level. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just saying like mm -hmm. some of say like pop music and, uh, right. you know, some kind of like really sort of cliche and kind of really uninteresting. So, I mean, it's hard for me to, to really listen to that too. Mm -hmm. So again, coming back to this talking about the levels, so it's really difficult to then to kind of say, you know, what is to what, what is to be done. I mean, what is to be done? I mean, you just kind of like, uh, I think from one level, something might be like incredibly complex, like say somebody who really has very little experience with harmony and composition might listen to, oh, I don't know, Nirvana or whatever, you know, just something. And they might find, that like on 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 the level of uh, you know some kind of very very complex music that might be Stockhausen for them you know mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand you know somebody might be listening to Stockhausen you know and then they might find that also simple I mean I never met that kind of person but I'm, I'm, I mm -hmm. think it's possible right uh, so as far as this complexity and simplicity I think that's very relative. But I think what's not relative is the integration. I think integration of emotion, physicality, and intellect. I don't think that's, I mean, I, I think it should be balanced. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of, um, thank that's you. my theme. Sorry, somebody's trying to deliver something to my doorstep. Uh, 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 okay. Sorry, so uh, I was listening to this poet uh, guy, uh, Dana Joya, speak about something that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the thought I wanted to run by you, which is basically like um, that as mm -hmm. poetry modernizes, it becomes less about form and it tries to get more and more free form, sort of like less metrical. And mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there's like sort of an over formalizing, like, you know, uh, whether you would think like Elliot Carter's or over formalized or not. Um, it seems like there's a sweet spot of form where it's not restrictive, but it's not, you know, sort of like totally free and meandering. Um, but I feel like you've mm -hmm. hit that sweet spot uh, with your sort of approach. And do you feel like there's a like a degradation of form or m meter or rhythm in the way that people are approaching uh, composition? I think that, uh, you know, when I was a student of composition, I remember I had this uh, Swiss composer, probably never heard of him, Pierre Wiesmer, but he was a very good composer, excellent composer. And he always had this theme. He used to say, it doesn't matter what, what language you're using. You know, it all expresses like, you know, the same things. And, mm -hmm. I, and I don't think that's true at all. Actually, I think that different systems express very different things. So I think things that are extremely intellectual, they just express extremely intellectual things. Right. Things that are like, say, uh, things that are extremely simple formally, but super expressive, like say blues, mm -hmm. you know, 
I mean, you know, 12 bar blues, I mean, can you get kind of like much simpler than that? Yet there is an incredible, I mean, I personally really like blues. So there, there's like an incredible emotion and expression in blues, like blues and gospel. These are like mm -hmm. two things I love, you know, whenever I uh, love bar and B and, and stuff like that. Jazz is perhaps in between. It's got a great groove. It's got great intellectual interest. And at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's got kind of like, it's, it's got more of a balance that way, but tends to be a bit more intellectual too, I think. Mm -hmm. More intellectual perhaps than, uh, than blues. And then there is rock, which depends, I mean, right. depends on what you're talking about. So I think all these different kinds of music, they have a level of expressivity. Mm -hmm. what what they express and what they mean like you know say uh very rhythmical extremely rhythmical music with very strong uh drums etc i mean they actually act physically on us you know mm -hmm. you listen to james brown I, if i listen to james brown i start to move you know because it's an extremely right. physical kind of music and and i mean um if you listen to say um some meditative music or i don't know you listen to uh say like uh the the the, the buddhist uh, uh throat singing or things like that i mean mm -hmm. this will act in a very different way that acts more on a meditative state so it's very low energy but very kind of like uh, you're very conscious very low energy you're expressing something very different more kind of tranquil peace peaceful emotions so if you, you know Personal psychology. Sorry? Transpersonal psychology. Mm, no. Okay, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> what it is like basically you have like high, very high energy uh, levels, and then you have very low energy. So the low energy levels would be like meditation mm -hmm. primarily. High energy levels are kind of like very high kind of speed and sort of like extremely mm -hmm. fast, energetic, ritual music. Mm -hmm. um, like ecstatic you know things like, pardon You're like ecstatic Ecstasis. yeah ecstatic exactly exactly ecstatic and then you have sort of like middle in the middle is like a you know it's kind of like personal music mm -hmm. it's like okay. pretty much what a person feels you know right so so this is just it's not just my theory but you know that's how i view it so i think then it depending on on which of these regions you're touching, you know, wh where you're connecting in these regions, then these different things will be expressed. So I have certain kinds of music that are very meditative, that are kind of like are pretty slow, and they might be going up, going down, but they're kind of essentially more meditative than anything else. Sometimes I have some kind of, not as much, but, you know, some higher speed and sort of high energy things, perhaps more when I was younger, you know, now I have a bit of a lower energy. <laughs> And then lots of music I have is kind of somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, in my opinion, that, that's kind of like something uh, that I've been kind of conscious of. And, and I can't say that I'm purposefully doing this mm -hmm. kind of music or that kind of music. It's more like I kind of let it happen a certain way. And now that I'm talking to you about it, I'm kind of more sort of the, the, theorizing about it but mm -hmm. actually i think it's like spontaneously that's how it works so what i'm saying is i think that uh you know atonal music tends to be more intellectual in general um you know tonal music tends to be more i mean i'm simplifying really yeah. simplifying you know you know tonal and modal music probably are more kind of like centered around the person and then you have these things that are more kind of like a um uh perhaps like more like uh tribal kind of musics you mm -hmm. know i mean like uh you know say like pentatonic and kind of uh you know model music and pentatonic music for me you know it's difficult to say what it is emotionally i think it functions more on a, on an energy level okay. sort of like more energy level even if you listen to say like the two types of pentatonic, you know, the Japanese, uh, you know, the minor major pentatonic, mm -hmm. I mean, they already kind of give you like a different sort of moods and, and different sort of energy. So, um, 
So there you go. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, like, you know, uh, to go off everything that you're saying, uh, like I'm thinking of your piece Unconscious in Brazil and, um, right. and you know, it's very meditative and sort of has its uh, ups and downs of energy. But um, something that I was curious about that is, you know, it has this very sort of, uh, I think it's in E flat uh, and there's this kind of like Lydian ish thing going on yeah, but it's yeah, like yeah. it's like lydian with like extra spices thrown in and so i'm curious uh if uh you were interested in like the writing of george russell and like the lydian chromatic concepts that uh he was pushing back in the day um, um i i just know about the book i mean okay. i know about the book you know the lydian concept but actually i can't tell you that i've uh, you know i never really studied that but I, I just tend to like Lydian. I mean, what can I say? It's just a, like, it's a beautiful moment. It's just a great moment. It expresses, uh, you know, whatever it expresses. But uh, my unconscious in Brazil is, is kind of, that's a quirky piece. That's mm -hmm. a quirky piece. That, that's a piece that's kind of going in other territories, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say maybe these things that I was talking about are more kind of like personal things. I would say unconscious in Brazil is it's called unconscious in brazil because it's kind of like going into the unconscious I mm -hmm. mean, and the unconscious is like a brazil <laughs> okay you know that was the it's, it's nothing to do with brazil really yep. it's just because for me unconscious is like a jungle you know you're just going inside of all, okay. all, all your unconscious uh, feelings and uh, everything and so this this i think uh, that's what it expresses really um, yeah, it's some kind of a polymodal, polytonal uh, sort of music. Yeah. It, yeah, I like that piece. I like that piece. <laughs> we all do. Um, so I, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Charlie Hayden earlier, and um, I, you know, in preparing for this interview, I, I came back to that Early to Rise record, which I've definitely uh, heard yeah. before, but it's it's been a while, and uh, I, I just loved listening to it. And I'm curious, um, can uh, you tell any thanks. sort of stories about Charlie Hayden, um, who... <laughs> you know, passed away a, a few years ago, I think. Um, yeah, he did. He yeah. did. You're right. You're um, right. I'd love to hear any sort of anecdotes from the sure, sure. together. Any well, I lessons? don't have any great. Yeah, I don't have any great stories. It was a long time ago too, mm -hmm. so I can't say that that I remember all that well. But you know, we just went into the studio. Uh, Lee Townsend was the producer. Lee Townsend is a really, really he did great productions. Uh, he still, I think, he manages Bill Frizzell, you know, okay. but he worked with a lot of great jazz musicians, Robin Ford and various other people. So anyway, he he got my my group together. So he got uh, with James Newton. I was already friends before, and then with Charlie Hayden and Tony Jones. You know, he was on, on drums and percussion. Nothing special about Charlie Hayden. He was very kind of matter of fact. He was very matter of fact. And, you know, the only thing that um, he mentioned to me was uh, when we started doing, uh, you know, we were playing early to rise. And, mm -hmm. and he said, he said, kind of European, isn't it? <laughs> you know? He said, uh, I worked with uh, with a guy, Roberto Gismonti. It's, it's a bit kind of like that. You know, that's what I said. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I said yes. It's it's a bit European, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Because I, I just came back from Europe, so I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, I forget that Charlie Hayden, you know, uh, like has like I think like a country music background to some extent. Like uh, I'm not sure. Like I'm there's not sure like you might. Yeah. I saw a documentary and like I think his daughters all play in like yeah. a country music band together or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm sort of curious also to go through some guitarists to get your uh, sort of like take on them or you know not to sure, get sure. you to make any. Criticisms, okay. but just a bit. No, no, fine, fine. Um, so you know, you mentioned Igberto Gismonti, or Gismonti. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but um, yes, uh, he's he's among my top five guitarists, uh, probably like you know, with you and a few others. But I'm curious uh, how much of his music you listen to. I'm honored. Yeah, okay. I I like I always liked uh, Igberto's uh, music very much, and, and as a matter of fact, kind of I worked with his son Alexander That's Gismonti. Fine. You know, we, we kind of worked. I invited him, was it last year, two years ago, I invited him to talk about Brazilian polymeter, polyrhythms. Okay. And so he, nice. he came over, he gave speech about his father's music and how, you know, the Brazilian uh, sources of poly, polymeter and polyrhythms. So uh, also there was a group that uh, uh, Alexander, so his son did a group with uh, 
two other musicians, um, Dimitar Ivanov, one Bulgarian uh, musician, and then uh, there was, um, uh, I mean, you know, you wouldn't know really these people necessarily, but anyway, it was a group with two guitars, uh, cello, and bass. Yes. And they did like a bunch of Egberto's music, that's why I mentioned you now. They did, uh, and, you know, and I was again becoming aware of how kind of brilliant this music is. You know, he's mm -hmm. like a brilliant composer. It's really, a, it's just, um, he just goes really into, into like various areas, you know, that just, few, very few Brazilian composers do that. I mean, there are some, of course, great Brazilian composers, but I mean, he's just completely exceptional. So I do know his music. I know what he recorded for ECM and, Mm -hmm. Also, even before that, I listened to some of his stuff. Um, um, Orfeu Nuovo, I think, instead of, mm. uh, you know, the old Orpheus, this was like a new Orpheus. There was an album a long, long time ago. So um, I did meet him also. I met him in Italy like some years ago. There was a festival called uh, uh, Sitar Guitar. Okay. So there were like sitarists and guitarists. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, it was kind of interesting. We talked about his guitar because he's got his 10 string guitar. Right. He was explaining to me how he plays it like a pianist. He said, I don't play like a guitar player. I play like a pianist, you know, so he just, you know, he just goes like this. So anyway, uh, yeah, great guy, really, really great composer. I think he's very unique and uh, mm -hmm. that's the best I can say about him. Um, in your uh, Wikipedia, I saw that you uh, collaborated with, I think his name is Arto Tunko Boyastan, or Tunko Boyasayan? Bayachi, yeah, 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 but that's really long time ago. It wasn't very much, uh, we didn't do all that much. We just well, got into a fight. <laughs> no, just um, kidding. I, I know that he, uh, he played with the guitarist Ben Maunder, and I'm curious if you are familiar with Ben Maunder's music. Um, not at all, I actually don't know. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, he's who, a who is it? he's a guitarist from New York uh, who's uh, I, I, I describe him describe him as pretty exhaustive sure. in a similar way. Um, but uh, kind of like yeah. how do I describe him? He, he's very you know, like all these stretchy chords that like you know like ah. every permutation of every single four note chord like that type of thing. Okay. Um, anyway, he he briefly played with him, mm. and so I was like, there's a connection between Dushan and Ben Maunder, ah. but. Um, uh, well, not really. Alas. Not, sorry um, about that. Sorry about <laughs> that. No, actually, I don't. Um, I, no, I've, I've never heard of him. I've never heard. Um, and what um, about uh, John McLaughlin? Well, I can't say that I've ever been a big fan. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, oh. but I mean, you know, now I'm retired, so I can say whatever. I want. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, it, he is like a, an incredibly impressive person. I'm always right. incredibly impressed. But to tell you the truth, it's kind of like a bit too speedy. You know, it's a bit too speedy for me. I mean, I, I listened to him in concerts too. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember there was like, uh, you know, I mean, whenever the Indian musicians come, like tabla players and then, you know, the Sarag players, I mean, there's just like beautiful lyricism that comes out. And John McLaughlin is a bit too techno. You know, right. For me, he's a bit too techno. But, you know, I have to admit, you know, in the days when I was listening first time to Shakti, you know, I was completely blown away by this stuff. I mean, I mm -hmm. thought that was incredible. And it is, it is, it's, it's, it's really impressive. But he's not necessarily uh, my cup of tea, so to say. I mm -hmm. think it's a bit, for me personally, it's a bit one dimensional. It's mm -hmm. a bit, to just technique, technique, how fast can I play? And I've never been very interested in that, you know, like the the McLaughlin, um, uh, uh, who was it? Um, well, anyway, you know, you know, you know mm -hmm. what, I'm, yeah. what I'm talking about. It was an Abercrombie, uh, who was it? Like the Mahu Vishnu? No, no, I was thinking, no, 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 I was thinking more of the trio with Paco de Lucia. Oh, yeah, 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 and like and, Aldo Miola. And, yeah. Right, right. I mean, great, you know, fantastic players, what can you right. say, you know, but again, you know, there's actually, I'm just kind of wondering <laughs> if I can find, there's like, there's some kind of very unusual new people that I come come across sometimes that nobody's ever heard of, I would like love there to hear was a, an, an, yeah, an Indian band, but you know, I have so many CDs here, I can't possibly uh, 
end it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I, I did like Ralph Stauner too. You know, okay. I liked yeah. Ralph Stauner. Yes, I liked Ralph Stauner. Uh, perhaps more as a composer than guitarist, although he's a great guitarist too. Mm -hmm. But I still remember. I love that stuff he did with Gary Burton, that uh, Matchbox. You know, that was this beautiful recording. I really like that very much. Um, what about like uh, Pat Metheny, for instance? Does that do anything for yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Pat Metheny is great. Yeah, I like Pat Metheny very much. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, he's very different from from uh, uh, <clears throat> from Mahavishnu. <laughs> Definitely. That's. Like, um, and mm -hmm. to throw a curveball, what about somebody like an Eddie Van Halen? <laughs> well, you know, I, my students were kind of always into that and doing. The, they were doing all this like tapping, you know, the finger mm -hmm. tapping and stuff. It wasn't necessarily my thing. It wasn't necessarily my thing. You know, again, like I think, um, I think I like blues players. I really like blues okay. players very much. Even like the old acoustic blues, you know, and you know, that's more kind of my kind of uh, mm -hmm. thing. You know, once you come to rock, when I was a kid, you know, there was in my time. You know, like I said, I loved very much the rhythm and blues. Sam and Dave, Aretha Franklin. James Brown was like my hero, you know, and uh, and then I was a I was a member of the Beatles fan club. You know, so I, that's how I learned my English. I learned my English through listening to Beatles songs, and all the chords. I still probably remember like all the Beatles songs, like all the chords, you know, starting with you know I wanna be your man and just going mm -hmm. further on to uh, the White Album and all that. So. Uh, once we come to like hard rock, heavy metal, and do, do all that, I mean, I was already doing classical music at that time. So then, then I kind of like, I know uh, about Van Halen just by hearsay, you know, mm -hmm. from my students. But I haven't really, uh, okay. I don't have any really opinion about that. Well, um, I have a few weird questions and a few easy questions, and I'll I'll let you okay. uh, get out of here. Okay, um, okay, no, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I guess just thinking about like the way that you are a rhythmic composer and sort of a, a, contra a contrapuntal composer and performer, um, I'm curious if you can sort of give me any sense of what uh, the qualitative experience of your internal clocks is like <laughs> from one uh, rhythmically focused guitarist to another. Hmm. It's kind of a weird question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, uh, it's interesting. I'm trying to, you. to understand. Yeah, I'm trying to find the, the, the perspective of, of, of you. You're talking about counterpoint. You're talking about the, about I guess, uh, rhythmical. I guess more more rhythm. Um, but like uh, like right. there's so much of a, a thing that you have to embody. Like whether it's improvising counterpoint or improvising uh, these right. polymetric things. Um, and so I'm curious right. how you think about mm -hmm. the embodiment of the rhythms and the sort of information. Um, you know, it, it's sort of, I think it, it's kind of, uh, you know, as, as, as you have certain levels internalized, they become reflex, mm -hmm. they, they become reflexive. So then, you know, you don't have to always think that you're in 5.8, let's say, let's say you're in 5.8. I mean, if you internalize that, then, you know, that's like three plus two, and it's kind of automatically ticking inside of you, like a metronome, it's kind of like a biological metronome. Mm -hmm. Then on this, you can build, say, like triplets or different kinds of uh, things. So I would say, I mean, sure, guitar is a very difficult instrument. So how many kind of rhythmical levels can you really have on a guitar? I mean, honestly speaking, I mean, yeah, if you're just, uh, if you're just performing written music, I mean, probably three, four levels, but if you're improvising, it's really tough. You know, I think mm -hmm. just two levels are sometimes good enough. Yeah. I mean, if you're really doing something intricate and interesting. So yeah, I, I, I think of it as kind of being fairly free, really. I mean, kind of like having, uh, just having like a, a baseline in there, you know, just having the pulse, which is kind of already, you sort of understand it's already there. So you don't think about it. So on top of that, then you're doing other things. That's how I would think about it. And the same thing with counterpoint, actually, mm -hmm. you know? But, you know, counterpoint, I, I sort of, um, I did a lot of these studies via species, called species. So you have like different proportions. So one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So meaning that, you know, you just kind of, 
build everything on these units. And so once you have the ones or the twos really kind of interiorized, if it's, if it's really integrated in your psyche, I think then the other levels are kind of much more free. So you can, you can develop that more freely. And that's where I think the quintuplets, sextuplets, septuplets, whatever they are, they kind of, on top of that, they become kind of just like fluctuating. You know, that's where, again, you know, thinking of Jeff, these incredible piano pieces that he wrote, it's just like this fluctuating sort of uh, like crystals, you know, going, you know, mm-hmm. as I said, I don't remember now how much they are, but, you know, 17 over 20. Right? <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. uh, now that, that, that is kind of, that's more complicated, <laughs> you know, right. because you would have to internalize either one or the other, you know, so if you can, if you can somehow comprehend 17, you know, and then, or comprehend 29, you know, then you're talking something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, 29 is a rough one. But I mean, I never got, yeah, I never got on, on to, mm-hmm. to that kind of a complexity as an improviser, as a composer, I might have, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I, nah. Part of me sort of doubts anybody that claims that they have internalized that, because I mean, that's like 17 times 29, that's a, a big number. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, there, there, there's this, this, you know, I mean, they were saying like, uh, for example, I've never seen Boulez conduct but you know, they were saying that Boulez could like conduct different meters with different hands. You know, mm. he could be doing three with one hand and seven with the other. So I mean, <laughs> what the hell? I mean, you know, <laughs> with the one lining you know. up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's like this. Um, well, <laughs> that's uh, right. Just like, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. In terms of counterpoint. Um, I sort of feel like this is like a counterpoint. It seems to be something that people don't talk about anymore. And um, I'm wondering if it's because it's so academic, like, you know, uh, like, I guess when I was studying it, like I learned sort of like mm-hmm. chorale writing early on, but um, I was sort of, I guess, like put off by the stuffiness of uh, like institutional, uh, you know, uh, contrapoint. Yeah, or no, contrapoint, I know. Rather. Um, I know. It's true. So I'm curious if there's like a sort of more like a folk version or like more of like a, uh, a non-academic version that, or like a non-academic frame that you can put on it? Well, I certainly hope so. You know, I certainly hope so. I mean, um, you know, this this uh, book on counterpoint, I mean, I purposefully put improvisation in there because, you know, I, I believe improvisation is so important. And, uh, and then it's also very specific. It's just like Renaissance counterpoint. And as I mentioned, you know, just a minute ago, I was talking about different species. So I went according to these different species, just uh, just to kind of categorize and to make it somewhat easier to actually learn, mm-hmm. you know, because when you have these different proportions, it's easier to learn that way. But if you do it kind of in a real fascist way, you know, where you just kind of have to do all this stuff and then you just kind of feel like you just hate it. At the end. Right. So I think, yeah, I, I, I just took this more as a, just a general orientation, okay. you know, to put it that way. You know. And uh, also, um, What's really great about counterpoint is not just the lines, it's also listening to intervals. Mm. Because, you know, you just suddenly hear all these intervals, but really super clearly, you know, and, and you hear like the suspensions and you hear the parallelisms and everything. And I have to say that um, I, I don't think I ever actually heard counterpoint as well as when I started writing this book. You mm. know, I started writing the book and then even just two voices, you know, just two voices that are very clear lines that you can actually hear with all the intervals. It's really, it's incredible. I mean, not to mention now the, all the microtonality, I mean, mm-hmm. listening to that, I mean, that's just yet another kind of uh, incredible, uh, incredible. And we, we perhaps don't have to get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, is there somebody that you think is like, uh, a great example of uh, somebody doing counterpoint really well these days. Um, like, if if you wanted yeah. to suggest somebody to listen to uh, for you know listeners to get a sense of like just astonishingly elegant counterpoint. Uh, like in what area? You mean like you mean improvisation or? I guess so. Yeah, or really just, just anything. Like, if there's anybody that comes to mind that is uh, exciting that I should check out or listeners should check out. You can say no too. <laughs> no, no, I actually don't know. I actually don't. I can't say because I, you know, I don't really. 
you know, I get so involved with my music that to tell you the truth, I don't really listen that much to music in okay. general. You know? um, uh, but, you I know, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, it's just kind of, I'm so kind of like, a, a, you know, I have overwhelming kind of amounts of music in my head that I don't really uh, listen too much. But, you know, there, there are some people like, uh, what's this guy's name? Uh, Hunter. Hunter? You know this guy. I can't remember his first oh, name. Charlie Hunter? Uh, Charlie Hunter. That's the, right. Like Charlie a string guitarist guy? Or like yeah, 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 yeah. I think that guy's pretty amazing. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, he's maybe a little bit cliche bass lines and stuff, but I mean, it works. And, it, and I mean, he plays really well. I mean, I was impressed. I, I listened to some of these things. I think I think those are pretty amazing. You know? mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's something where, you know, but it's also kind of, how shall I say, uh, uh, counterpoint is not really so kind of massively used in jazz guitar. You know, mm -hmm. It's not. I mean, it's just, it's a linear instrument. You know, you either play chords, essentially, or, I mean, I'm saying, sure, Joe Pass, you know, mm -hmm. did, you know, you listen to Joe Pass, there's like all kinds of stuff. But still, still, essentially, you, you either have lines or you have chords, sometimes the mixture, but to have kind of like a combination of the two. Yeah, I haven't heard too many of that. Um, as a matter of fact, I had one student for this past two years, Alex de Viena, if mm. that means anything to you. Nope. No, it doesn't. He's a Brazilian. <laughs> well, you know, there's all kinds of people. You know, so anyway, he's mm. a Brazilian guitarist, excellent Brazilian guitarist. And um, we did, uh, we did uh, it's called uh, the research project, like a research project on playing counterpoint, improvising counterpoint uh, on jazz guitar, actually. Interesting, cool. Yeah, so he has done already, he has a website and all this, he set up, you know, so he did already, uh, I think I think we started with some kind of earlier, uh, like Schofield, you know, he transcribes on Schofield. Some of this, these are, this is kind of like implied counterpoint. It's not always like it's necessarily really contrapuntal. Gotcha. Uh, Ralph Towner is often also implied polyrhythm and polymeter. You you know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily like they are superposed lines. Right. They, they could be often like arpeggios that are thought of in terms of different kind of metric divisions and subdivisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was very interesting. I think he's going to, you know, he's continuing with this project. And, uh, you, know, he had, you know, he actually went to see Ralph Towner in Rome or somewhere. I think now Ralph Thunder lives in Rome, so I think he's been kind of um, corresponding and working with him, and um, you know, with me, you know. So anyway, it, it's a it's a work in progress. I think counterpoint improvisation, uh, improvising counterpoint, it's a work in progress. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I guess like I was trying to study that in in college, and I feel like your uh, your counterpoint your counterpoint book was always checked out or something like that. And so I never got to spend the full <laughs> amount of time with it. But um, anyway, uh, That's nice. uh, so you mentioned uh, microtonality and um, I'm curious if, mm. you, if you've had a chance to play with any of uh, Michael Kadurka's microtone guitars with the interchangeable well, fretboards. You know, yes, yes, I know, I know. No, actually uh, I had a chance when I was living in San Francisco, David Tannenbaum gave me this national steel guitar. Mm. There was a national steel guitar, and he had it already uh, tuned in a particular way. So, so it, it it was tuned microtonal, and so I wrote this piece called "Village Music," which actually Mike has uh, recorded. He did a video of that, and he just he can actually play this. I mean, it's just uh, it's just mind blowing. It's just such a complicated piece. I mean, you know, I'm just amazed that I could write this, but I'm more amazed that he can actually play it. <laughs> so anyway, that piece, uh, that piece is entirely based on the uh, on, uh, microtone. And then I wrote also this uh, two blue meditations for Mike mm -hmm. just recently. That's my perhaps one of my latest pieces, and um, you know used uh, just intonation. But I'm hardly the expert, you know, mm -hmm. on microtonal music. I mean, you know, I have more kind of like an intuition about it. Um, mm -hmm. but I can't say that, that I really, that I can hear it all that well. I mean, I would have to really kind of get involved in this very much. I mean, I, yeah. I, I was involved with music of Maurice Ohana to some extent. And actually Jeff, Jeff was playing some of the, the Ohana's pieces when he was studying in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And we did uh, some arrangements, actually, of uh, Cadran Lunaire. That was one of the pieces. Oh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Jeff, Jeff was really into it. I mean, even at that time, he found microtonality extremely interesting. And we both liked Ohana very much. So, uh, yeah, so, so I'm not a, you know, I'm not a stranger to microtonality, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not, uh, I'm hardly the expert. I mean, you know, like what Jeff does, you know, and, uh, Mike, I mean, I mean, they're really kind of, they're really swimming. They're involved in this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, I guess I've always been sort of disappointed that by being a guitarist, it kind of uh, excludes you from the microtonal world just because like it, you know, it requires getting a new guitar that then you only play that on. And it's like, uh, and I feel like that's something that I would want to explore with a computer, but I'm just like, I, I'm not going to mess around with my frets and where they're placed. Right. <laughs> um, well, uh, so you have this piece, uh, Posicalia, or sorry, Introduction to Posicalia and Fugue for the Golden Flower. And um, I've had the pleasure of uh, not doing it justice in my uh, you know, <laughs> earlier years. Uh, but oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so as far as I understand it, the golden flower is referencing this sort of like Chinese Taoism. Uh, uh, it's a Taoist text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, right. I'm, I'm curious what uh, Taoism means to you. If, I mean, I assume it does mean something right. to you, uh, but like, uh, you know, uh, what that sort of like, uh, where, is, where, do you, where does your mind go with that? Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, that's kind of, uh, you know, that's another story altogether. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I just really, uh, you know, I have a lot of kind of affection, let's say, or, you know, a lot of affection for Taoism and Buddhism. These are like two, perhaps more as philosophies than necessarily religions, more mm -hmm. as a philosophy or like, a, a you know, practicing meditation, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah, this was uh, in particular, you know, I, I liked really reading Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu, as you know, you, you maybe have read too. You know? So anyway, some of the ideas were just to kind of let the thing somehow evolve on its own. It's sort mm -hmm. of like a development without too much kind of a, too much interference of the ego, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. that, you know, you're letting somehow the music itself be its own being, quote unquote. And so this is what this was. And, and actually, when I started, I got on a, a wrong foot, so to say. I started with some kind of Indian uh, complicated scale. <laughs> and it was just kind of, it became this intellectual kind of troublesome thing. And then, then after three days, you know, I just thought, oh, come on, you know, this is not what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so then I came to this Pasakalia, what it was, you know, and it just kind of happened completely spontaneously. So. So, you know, to put it this way too, you know, I mean, it's a struggle sometimes, you know, it's a struggle because, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's really important to have some kind of a guiding principle that, that something that will let you kind of develop your intuition and the direction, you know, of some sort and have some kind of coherence and integrity of what you're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you know, I, I mean, intellect is so kind of free, you know, we can think of anything, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's not the point, you know. So anyway, so that was what this was about. And then it's also kind of like a um, focusing, really, kind of focusing and uh, just following something that comes very naturally. And I can say that's been perhaps, I mean, whatever that means, you know, that's been kind of like one of my main kind of directions, you know. It's like, uh, just following some sort of a some sort of a thread. Let's mm. put it that way. Following a thread, and then uh, I mentioned there was like I, I talked to somebody else uh, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned this Morton Feldman, you know, composer. Mm. Maybe you know Morton Feldman. Mm. He he mentions in his book is very funny guy, extremely funny. I mm. find I just love reading his texts. They're just like incredible. So anyway, he mentions that in composition, it's kind of like. It's as, as it is if you are going on a walk in an Irish village. And then, you know, when you ask for certain directions, then what they tell, they tell you, you just go this way, then you will see a church on your left. Ignore it. You just continue, then you will see, I don't know, something else. Ignore it. And then, you know, so the point is, okay. 
there are all these intellectual egotistical distractions so to say you just mm. get infatuated with a chord somewhere or like oh whoa there's like this incredible polyrhythm somewhere right but ignore it ignore mm -hmm. it that's not the point you just follow the thread so that would be that's probably the, the best way i could e express my uh, my orientation for that then the other thing out of buddhism what i found incredibly important was kind of the, the the openness the openness of the vision so to say and kind of like a capacity of kind of uh, 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 recreating the form and recreating the language so that you're kind of I mean, ideally you could go from the zero I mean every time I start a piece I start from zero but of course, I mean, there are various kind of tools and techniques that come into play. But I would say that that has been also one of my, my important guiding principles. And that's maybe also why I have so much variety in what I do. Mm. It's because I don't necessarily lock into anything. I mean, I just feel like something is happening. And if it's happening, I usually don't ask. I just let it go. Mm. And then if there's a problem, then I start analyzing, you know. So for me, analysis is usually kind of a sign that I need to kind of figure something out. And um, so I think it's kind of like uh, letting this sort of, this, this musical being develop itself from, from where it starts. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always start from the same place. So then you have to follow the direction of this particular thing that is being created. And then there is every time it's being created, there's like a, there's a different system in being. It might be a little bit off. It might be a little bit on. And occasionally I've done like this Renaissance music that's almost Renaissance music, but yet it's a little bit off here and there. Mm -hmm. And I kind of really like that. You know, there's something, I find something very attractive about it. It's not like you are imitating anything or it's not like you're trying to write Renaissance music. Not at all. Absolutely not. No, I think it's um, something I find very interesting. interesting. Um, so. In terms of like a, a meditation practice, uh, while I don't want to mm -hmm. uh, be too invasive or anything, mm -hmm. I'm curious uh, it, what uh, if you can like give me a sense of what your meditation practice is like, um, if you do have one. You mean just, uh, like, you don't mean musical, you just mean it just like I mean, in terms of like meditation, you know? like uh, sitting down yeah. for 30 minutes with your eyes closed or like, uh, is it uh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, just 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 kind of following your breathing, really. I mean, just just following the breathing and and just kind of following the thoughts, you know, and hopefully letting them unwind, mm -hmm. you know, and you become more present and more conscious. I mean, that's pretty much. Is it something that you um, do like in the morning or like uh, middle of the day? Like, is there any sort of like uh, regularity to mm. when you do it or? Like a ritual I'm to it. I'm not very disciplined. I'm not very disciplined. Mm. I mean, I I I, <laughs> I find that difficult to do. You know, I, I remember I was like in this. Uh, there was this uh, Buddhist temple. I was in Kyoto, a long time, maybe ten years ago, and I just stayed at this Buddhist temple. Actually, I stayed because it was really not expensive. It was very cheap, mm -hmm. and they had great vegetarian food and everything. But I just couldn't bring myself to go to this like zazen at five o'clock in the morning. Right. I just kind of. Uh, so sorry i mean i'm just not uh i'm not that kind of person so mm -hmm. i i make my own discipline so to speak you know so when i feel that i really need it you know maybe in the morning sometimes in the nature i mean nature is fantastic you know, nature is great for meditation i think uh um i used to have these kinds of uh, no you, you're kind of getting me to talk about this kind of strange stuff <laughs> but um um maybe oh maybe 20 years ago time goes by you know but maybe 20 years ago i used to do a lot of these kinds of like what i call the buddhist walks okay that's what i called it i mean i don't know if it is that's what it is anyway what it was i would start from my place where i was in my apartment and then i would just go i didn't know where i would just go and then kind of wind up somewhere hopefully hopefully not in some kind of slums area but mm -hmm. you know so i did a lot of these kinds of like kind of purposeless walks and i kind of really like that you know it's a bit 
it's a bit kind of like this, uh, you know, like composing in the same sense. It's kind of like purposeless. I mean, you just start with something. You don't really know what you're starting with. You're starting with something, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are my, uh, okay. my cool. orientations. Yeah. Well, um, the last thing I'll ask you uh, is basically... Mm -hmm. Uh, if you find computer music interesting at all, um, if you find it off-putting, or like if there's if you like don't engage with it whatsoever, um, I asked this as somebody who you know got a degree in guitar and then eventually was like, this is a heavy instrument to carry around, and uh, this uh, laptop can do anything, and like there's this sort of like blank yeah. slate quality to using Max mm -hmm. MSP, and you brought up you know the brainwave music, so I'm curious, um, sort of like if it gives you anything, if you find it interesting, if you find it tedious uh you know mm -hmm. if you find it unethical <laughs> or something well yeah no i i, I mean sometimes some, sometimes i like to listen to it uh, i mean it's just it's not necessarily something that uh that i've done very much i studied you know i worked with synthesizers when i was a student again comes to my student days in geneva and i worked in a you know electronic studio and, and i did kind of work for a while with that mm maybe two years or so. And was that like a, um, like a pretty, like a, from the ground up type thing, like dealing with oscillators oh, yeah. and filters? Oh, totally, kind of, totally like primitive stuff. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just uh, like ring modulators and things like that, like very okay. kind of like simple, you know, filters and stuff like that. It was very enjoyable, I liked it. It was kind of like a game, like a, like a children's play or something, I, mm -hmm. I liked it. Um, but then I sort of lost interest in mm -hmm. that. And then I haven't done it very much. Uh, I just haven't been very much in touch with it, you know. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I listen to stuff and I find it very intriguing. And, and I'm not nothing uh, against it. I just haven't done very much of it, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't have any, any, any other kind of special uh, opinion about it. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're talking about computer music, you mean like, uh, you know, like the the Max, uh, the Max program and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's or what like you're a, talking about. Or even, um, I guess I take it even further to just say like any sort of uh, like non uh, acoustic thing. Like, you know, I mean, maybe even like, you know, I'd include like Kanlan Nankaro in this almost because uh, it's like this yeah. mechanistic sort of uh, uh, right. music that's not depending on the human, uh, you know, capabilities. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, not non Caro is incredible. I mean, I mean, you know, what can you say? You know, just my, uh, when when I teaching about this uh, rhythmic complexity, I mean, he just naturally comes there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as as everybody knows, he inspired Ligeti. You know, he was like one of the main inspirations. So, so yeah, I think I think you know the machines are you know they can do a lot of miraculous stuff. You know, it's 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 incredible. That's kind of another theme. I think it's an interesting theme also, which is uh, intuition versus construction. Mm -hmm. So it's like I think that kind of intuitively, lots of people can come up with lots of very interesting stuff, but you're somewhat limited if you only do things intuitively. I think, and and that's where I think construction is sometimes important to do something that you cannot do, mm -hmm. like what you are saying. Even like, for example, doing these polyrhythmic exercises, I couldn't just do, the, do, do that without figuring it out. So actually that was a construction, it was a construct. So in a similar way, you know, the, 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 the non caro music is a construct, it's a construction. So I think there's something to be said about construction and it's hard to know really um, how far this should fly, I mean, or should it, or it shouldn't, I mean, again, I think it's it's anything is really possible. I, I have absolutely nothing against the construction as long as it's again kind of like keeping an integrated uh, integrated balance of the human being. I mean, you know what, mm -hmm. what I keep on saying before. If it's something that's integrated, I think I think it's fine. You know, uh, what 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 I often find is a problem is that it's kind of like somehow this particular aspect of say like. Nancaro, you know, it's a particular aspect. He's like a like an obsessed scientist almost. Mm -hmm. You know, he's almost not a musician. You know, right. So what I hear is I hear that I hear this incredible, uh, you know, incredible uh, obsession, incredible complexity, uh, complexity, creativity, etc. 
that there's not much more than that, really. I mean, when you're listening to it, I mean, uh, I don't know if I can say I'm emotionally, uh, especially uh, touched or anything, you know, mm-hmm. so perhaps that's that's missing. But then you don't have to all, always be kind of emotionally touched either. So I think mm-hmm. it's it's all kind of, um, it all depends really on what, what area uh, uh, what area you're in what area your person is and what kind of personality you have and Mm -hmm. you know that kind of stuff i mean i don't see any absolutes there but uh, yeah well okay i see the the sun setting over there behind you so i feel like that's (laughs) my cue to let you get on with your evening um well i I think the Oh, the pizza's getting cold. The pizza's <laughs> getting cold. That's the main problem. <laughs> well, yes, please, please go eat your pizza. Uh, Dushan Bogdanovich, okay. this has been such a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much for joining me. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Okay. We'll talk to you in the future, hopefully. Take care. Adios. Take care. <laughs>